What's up guys, Lundick here and I'm back and it's another Q&A session today and it's obviously it's a WCW Q&A which I put up a couple of weeks ago and it's time to get down to it really so yep, questions have been sent now I'm going to answer the questions pretty sure you know how this all works just ignore that noise please it's... Well, I'm pretty sure you know how this all works now so no need for the introduction so let's get to the questions obviously like this is in the random order that youtubers put them in so if you're last and all that don't be upset about it and all that so here we go first question it's just one question from michael shepherdson what is your favorite wcw match of all time so yeah like i said before when i'm when i mean wcw i mean when actually ted 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 that ted turner bought the company out in late 1988 to March 26, 2001. So, if I had to pick one, and it's an obvious, it's an obvious choice, really, for me, anyway, and that's obviously Ric Flair, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat, two out of three falls, Clash of the Champions, six April 1989. So yeah, for me, anyway, from what I've seen over the years, this is probably the greatest wrestling match of all time, in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's often debated what's the best match of all time. And there's a lot of great answers. Um, but for me, what the best series of matches of all time, and not much debate in my eyes, the best series of matches ever is that Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat trilogy in 89, at Shy Town Rumble, Clash of the Champions, and then Wrestle War. But the second one, the second match they had, Clash of the Champions, unbelievable match. Young fans, if you haven't seen this match, you have to watch it. It's quite, I'm sure it's quite educational, uh, really, to show what a wrestling match can be. It's two out of three falls, went nearly, went all 55 minutes. It had people believe it was going to go the full hour, but it ended at 55 minutes. It was on free television, up against WrestleMania 5. But yeah, just an amazing match. You had two of the greatest of all time in Flair and Steamboat at the absolute peaks of the careers at the same time. Unreal match, just honestly, something something like truly, truly, truly special. Uh, next question from William Howe One. There's just one question. So what is your favourite WCW pay-per-view? That's got to be Great American Bash 89. That's a classic. That's one of the best pay-per-views ever. Uh, for me, it's the best WCW pay-per-view ever. It's close to rather than the best WF pay-per-view. Incredible pay-per-view. Absolute tremendous. Those last four matches, though, I mean, the undercard's just decent. Like, with stuff like the Battle Royal and Brian Pillman versus Bill Irwin, and I think there was... Was it Jim Cornette and... Paul Ellerin fought somebody, but I can't remember. Might have been Teddy Long, actually, I think. Possibly. But then you had a really good three-minute match between the Steiners and Kevin Sullivan and Mike Rotunda, and then... Last four matches of the show were absolutely incredible. Starting off with the Sting Great Muta for the television title. Absolute, probably the best match under 10 minutes you'll ever see. Uh, underrated and forgotten War Games match between the Road Warriors and Midnight Express. And I think it was Steve Williams against uh, Fabulous Freebirds and the Simone SWAT team. And then the two big ones. United States title, Ricky Steamboat, Lex Luger. That was one of Luger's best ever matches. And another awesome match. It went, it went just over 10 minutes. And then, tremendous main event between Ric Flair and Terry Funk. So, yeah, just, if you have to seek that pay-per-view out. And a couple of honourable mentions. I'll just throw a couple of honourable mentions out there. Spring Stampede 1994. That's an amazing pay-per-view. Super Brawl 3, it's a tremendous pay-per-view. So yeah, those ones, but has to be Great American Bash, really. And then we got a set of questions from Jericholic8704. What was your reaction to the NWO and person in the form for Horseman? I hated that, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, it was kind of amusing, but I uh, just, no, I just, uh, I don't know. I just thought it was deeply disrespectful. I mean, the week before I had, Arn Anderson in one of the most emotional wrestling retirements of all time. 
I mean, people talk about the Daniel Bryan one this year. The Ric Flair quote-unquote retirement, sarcastic quotation marks, in 2008. But uh, this is one that always gets forgotten about when Arn Anderson retired from a neck, neck injury in 1997. Then the NWO come out the next week and just, ugh, they just completely shit on it. And I get what they were going for, but it just, ugh. Just seemed a bit disrespectful for me anyway. Um, just sound like a look, bunch of uh, bunch of grown men acting like high school kids. Yeah. Yeah, it was just bad. It was just a bad taste. And I think the worst part of it all was the fact that nobody actually booked the horsemen uh, running and attack the NWO. So not only were they absolutely mocking the shit out of Arn Anderson, the horsemen looked like cowards for not doing anything about it. So... Yeah, ah, I didn't like it anyway. I thought, I, I, don't, I don't know one of those like humorless twats or anything, but I just didn't think it was that funny. Then we got, uh, do you like the hog slash road wild outdoor pay view settings? Yeah, I do, I really do. I mean, especially at the time when, uh, I mean, good God, uh, now we have 20 pay views a year and for one company. But this is the time when pay views are expanding to one a month. Uh, so both the Dwef and WCW were doing it. Um, obviously before that you had five pay-per-views a year for the WWF. Maybe five or six from WCW a year. And now you're getting monthly pay-per-views. So what I liked about it is it looked different. It, it felt and looked a bit different. But from a visual standpoint, I liked it. I thought it was really good. It, looked, it just looked pretty cool. The only thing though is... Most of the biters were absolutely off the tits, uh, pissed as fuck. Um, most of them weren't really wrestling fans, so they didn't have a clue what was going on type thing. But I liked it anyway. I thought it had potential. And the only thing, though, was a bit silly doing it is obviously there was no live gates, so they actually didn't make a dime off of these pay-per-views because, wait, for the, for the attendance anyway. But, yeah, I liked it anyway. Then we go... Top 5 Cruiserweight Championship matches of all time. Now this one has to limit me answer because obviously if it was Cruiserweight Division it would have been a lot easier but it's been limited just to the just to the championship one so obviously number one has to be, obviously that's probably the easiest one ever Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio Jr. Halloween Havoc 1997 There's no other answer to that one really is the, to be honest I mean that that's a that's a five star match, one of the best matches Dewey Stewie ever put on. One of the best cruiserweight matches ever. One of the best matches ever, period. Just an amazing match. If you haven't seen that match, where the hell have you been for the last 19 years? If you've got the network, it's on there. So get yourself watching that one. Amazing match. Best match of both men's careers in my opinion. It's a tremendous match. And then number two. Dean Malenko, Rey Mysterio from Great American Bash 1996. This was Rey Mysterio's first ever match in WCW on a pay-per-view. With Dean Malenko, who was on the top of his game at the time. And yeah, just absolutely outstanding match. Really was a great, great match. Yeah. It was like, good story of the high flyer taking on the uh, technical wrestler. Just really, really enjoyed that one then. Number three... Dean Malenko, Ultimo Dragon from Starcade 1986. So, yeah, another awesome match with Malenko. Malenko had a bunch of awesome matches in 1985 and 1987. Uh, we've got a lot of different guys as well. So, not only did you have them with Rey Mysterio, he had a tremendous one of Ultimo Dragon. I think this is the time Ultimo Dragon was a uh, J Crown champion. That's uh, when all the junior heavyweight titles in Japan banded together to make one title. Although instead of having just one belt, he walked around with like seven championships. And then, uh, then he won the WCW Cruiserweight title that night as well. So he ended up with eight, eight different titles. Uh, and then we got number four. Rey Mysterio vs. Hoover 2, Guerrero vs. Billy Kidman, Starcade 1988. Tremendous freeway opener. Really enjoyed that match. Thought it was tremendous. Um, but definitely the best thing on that show by a mile. And the best match in 1988. And then... Number five, I guess, because uh, Chris Jericho, who and who Guerrero Super Brawl eight, thought that was a different. That was a great storytelling. That was when 
Jericho was just becoming a just becoming a name, he was getting a lot better and all that. Hooven too. I also thought Hooven too was quite underrated for me. But yeah, I thought that was a great match. There we go, what have we got next? Have you seen Ready to Rumble and know what you think of it? No, and I don't ever want to watch it. It looks fucking... I saw the Wrestling With Regrets review of it and oh, I don't know. It just looks stupid and it probably rocked my brain a little bit if I watched it. And I'm not... I'm, I don't ever intend to watch it either. Then last question. What were, you, what, were you able to see and hear about Lex Luger showing up on the first night? Or if so, what was your reaction at the time? I didn't see it at the time, I mean... Honestly, like, I didn't watch that first night or so I didn't know, really. I remember, like, at the time, I think I hadn't seen Lex Luger on Do It Ref for, for a while. Then, I, I, I bet it was about, I bet it was weeks, like, several weeks later, possibly even a couple of months, and I switched to WCW and there was Lex Luger. So I didn't know, I didn't know, like, all about this jump to Nitro under the Do Ref's nose until years later, but... I think it would have been awesome to see that live. That was a really shocking moment. Then we've got next set of questions from Mr. Beetle890. In 2000, the WCW world title changed hands in brackets, including Vegas 25 times. Your thoughts, really? Like, I knew it changed a lot, but I didn't, I've never actually like, sat and counted it before. But if you say it's 25, I believe you. But yeah, that was just awful, really, wasn't it? I mean. And that's the world title, that's never minding all the lesser titles that they've changed hands a hundred times. I mean, yeah, WCW 2000 was truly, truly wretched. You don't, if you weren't there, you'll never truly know how bad it was. I mean, I hear people bitching about Raw and all that now, and they do it now, but holy fuck. The worst wrestling ever was WCW 2000. Yeah, it just completely kills the title, really, doesn't it, when you have it. I remember like Jeff Jarrett had like four title reigns in about two months or something stupid like that. Um, so yeah, off the top of my head, I mean, Bret Hart had it first, but then he had to retire. Chris Benoit had it for a day. Sid had it. Jarrett had it. DDP had it for a little bit. <sighs> Dave Rockett had it. Oh, God. It feels awful just saying that. And Kevin Nash had it once or twice. Booker T had the title, and Scott, oh god, oh, even worse, fucking Russo had the cunt. But what a fucking prick. Well, that, that, that annoys me about Vince Russo, he babbles on about people like Kevin Owens not being believable as champions. But this fucking bell end booked David Arquette and himself to have the fucking title, and Jeff Jarrett five or six times, or four times, or whatever. Then finally, Scott Steiner had a steady rate at the end of the year, so. Yeah, obviously, when you do that, it just kills all credibility of the title, doesn't it, really? And that's the world title, not to mention the amount of fucking tag title changes. I mean, if I'm sure if, if anyone, I, I challenge anyone to count how many title changes there were all year in WCW and post it in the comment section. I bet it's probably in the at least 60, but yeah, but awful. And what have we got now? Which WF wrestlers would have benefited from jumping to WCW but didn't? That's a hard question to answer because up until like a certain point, say like 98, 99, almost anyone that was anyone ended up going to WCW really, didn't they? I mean, I would say the majority of people who would be stars in WWE from the early to mid 90s found the way in WCW at some point. Um, obviously the one probably Shawn Michaels, I suppose. But I'm, I've, I've always been curious to see how Shawn would have uh, done in WCW. I, mean, I think he certainly would have fared better than Brett did because of his political allies and all that. But he wouldn't have been pushed like he was in the WWF. Um, Yoko Zuna maybe could have benefited from going to WCW at some point. Like, say like after 94 when his top line run the WWF ended. Maybe he could have been a Hogan opponent or something like that. Jerry Lawler, maybe? That might have been somewhat interesting. There's one that I say definitely wouldn't, and that's The Undertaker. I mean, this is going off topic a little bit, but I don't think The Undertaker would have done well in WCW, and I'll tell you why. Because main reason being that if he went to WCW, he couldn't be The Undertaker because 
Vince own that trademark. And obviously, not a chance in hell he would have let one of his greatest creations have his gimmick in WCW, I mean. And you're probably thinking, yeah, but Diesel and Razor did all right without the gimmicks, which is fair comment, but I think, like, for The Undertaker, that was, like, his gimmick was so, like, so him that it would have... If he'd have went there and ended up being like Mark Calloway or something like that, would just wouldn't have worked. It would have been like, let's just say, for example, Sting went to the WF in like 1995, 1996, but he couldn't be Sting. He had he just came in as Steve Borden. Wouldn't be the same at all, would it really? And then, right, this is a hard one, but obviously because I got these questions a couple of weeks ago, I had to kind of mull a couple of them over before answering his got. Worst WCW pay-per-view now. I'm sure if you've been a long-term follower of the channel, you remember a couple of years ago, I did all the WCW 2000 pay-per-views. And it was fucking wretched. They were pretty much all horrible. Well, not all of them, but most of them were horrible. Some of them were absolute abominations. Um, so if I have to, if I have to pick one, I would narrow it down to four. And that's Super Brawl 2000. Uncensored 2000, um, Halloween Havoc 2000, and Great American Bash 2000. Of all the horrible ones, them four uh, stick out. And then obviously Great American Bash 1991, several years earlier, was horrible as well. So what I, if I go out to limb and say what was the worst WCW pay-per-view of all time, I'll go with Uncensored 2000 because, oh, fuck me. If you want to watch me review of it, you can find it on my channel and all that a couple of years ago. There wasn't a single good match on there. I mean, you had Hogan Flair now. What a yappa pie fucking strap match or something stupid. Sting and Luger, that was fucking awful. Uh, Terry Funk and Dustin Rhodes. Um, Big Booker T and Kidman versus Harlem Heat 2000. Like, I can't even remember most of the card, which was that awful. Um, what else? I think Sid and Jarrett was a title match, if I remember rightly, but yeah. What, yeah, just do whatever you, if you want to, like, punish yourself or something, you can watch that pay of view, I suppose. Then we got, what's it? Lonely Fanboy 48. Yeah. Why is Sean Stasiak so bad during when WCW and ECW are facing WWE? Right. I think you're talking about the invasion here, but, because you haven't, Worded that particularly good, but yeah, I think he was getting punished, wasn't he? Because if I remember rightly, his dude F run ended in controversy. Um, I can't remember all the details, but um, you got you, you got caught, got caught videotaping wrestlers' conversations basically, and ended up getting fired, going to WCW, coming back, and then yeah, he was treated, well, he was treated like a comedy character, wasn't he? Uh, he was, uh, he was gay. Uh, Booked as a dopey bastard, always screwing up and stuff like that. But it was kind of funny though. Um, I mean, to be fair, Sean Stasiak, I always thought was like totally mediocre talent. Um, nothing against the guy or anything, but I just think, yeah, I just think he was bang on. Ugh, he just wasn't very good, really. He was just an all right performer, so it's not really a big deal to me. But yeah, I think that's the reason we go. What is the best Starcade pay of you? Ah. Best Starcade pay per view was probably 1985, but that was NWA Starcade. So, what was the best WCW Starcade? So, from 88 to uh, 2000. It's a toss up for me. It's got to be either 1995 or 1996. I would, if I have to pick, but obviously, it's like either of these could be the right answer, but probably say 1996 because you had a uh, Pretty damn good undercard of Malenko and uh, Dragon. Rear in Justin Liger in a something of a dream match. I mean, I think Chris Benoit and Jeff Jarrett had a really good match as well. Um, obviously, Hogan and Piper sucked as a match, but it was a big draw and all that. And yeah, just got, obviously, like, the, the product was so hot at the time. The NWO was on fire. Yeah, so I'll probably go with 1996. There we go. Is Greed in brackets do his last pay per view a good pay per view? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll review this one as well, but yeah, I think it's actually a good pay per view. I wouldn't like, sit there and say it's one of the best pay per views ever, but it's actually quite a good pay per view overall. I mean, 
I mean, I've, I've watched it again earlier this year, I think. It was obviously 15 years ago now, at the end of WCW, and it, it's one of those pay that everyone has to see at least once, because it really is an end of an era. I mean, end of an era gets thrown out a lot in wrestling, but this one really is the end of an era. I mean, this was the end of WCW after all these years of competing with Vince. Um, started off with a really good cruiserweight match between Kui Wee and Elix Skipper. No, not Elix Skipper, fuck. Jason Jett. Then it was a really awesome match between Elix Skipper and Kid Romeo against Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman for the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team titles. A very short-lived title, obviously, only lasted eight days because the company died eight days later. Um, I'm trying to think what else we had. Oh, Shane Helms and Chavo Guerrero had an excellent match for the uh, US title. No, not the US title. Fuck me. Cruiserweight title. A fun match between uh, Ric Flair and Jeff Jarrett against Dusty and Dusty Rhodes. Kind of cool to see Ric Flair and Dusty going at it again after all these years. And a really good main event between DDP and Scott Steiner. That's a real... That'll go down as the last WCW pay-per-view main event ever. And it was actually a pretty good one. And then with Starcade 2000, a sad note, and the Starcade uh, chrono chronologically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was sad. I mean, the, the last do we say we, the last Starcade was 2000. Although, I, don't, I, don't think, I think Starcade 2000 was actually an alright show, to be fair. I mean, was it a great show? No. Was it a bad show? No. It was, a, it was certainly a hell of a lot better than 1999. That was fucking awful. Um, has to be said that was absolutely horrible and um, but it was, yeah just obviously do cw had lost so much steam by that point the biggest show of the year star kid didn't feel big at all sid and steiner fairly forgettable main event i think was goldberg and luger on that one as well i think i mean that was a core cool main event if i remember right Um it did have that really good uh six-way ladder match though between three count and the young dragon that was pretty cool but yeah Although it was better than 1999, though, and then it was the last Nitro episode of Good Show. It was all right. As a show, it was all right, but it's one of those shows that people have to see because it's like that historic type thing. Um, had some good stuff on there, though. I mean, Booker T and Scott Steiner had a really good uh, match for the world title. Uh, pretty good, solid, under 10 minute match. Uh, we had uh, Charvo and Shane Helms had another match. Ray and Kidman had another match of uh, Hooven 2 and I'm not, not fucking Hooven, he's except for Kid Romeo. And obviously, uh, went out with Ric Flair and Sting, which was a great touch. I uh, really liked that. I was really happy that that closed out WCW. And of course, the short end and angle of Shane buying WCW. So that was, so yeah, obviously, that's another show everyone has to see. If you've got the network, it's on there now. Every single episode of Monday Nitro is on the network, so... You haven't seen that last episode of Nitro, you really need to watch it. It's that it's a, it's just historic. But yeah, I'd say March 26, 2001 was arguably the most historic night in the history of the business. And for me, the business as I knew it died that day really, but yeah. Then we got Tyler Overt Street. Who are your favourites in the cruiserweight division? Obviously, bar an answer be Ray Mysterio. I think nearly everyone would say that. Um for me, he was the WCW Cruiserweight division. Biggest starter ever come out of there. Um, Nadine Malenko, I mean, a big fan of Malenko's work in the Cruiserweight division. I know he's kind of boring and all that and didn't have much personality, but in the context of the Cruiserweight division, I think it was awesome. Like at the time, most of them were doing high flying stuff, but I think Malenko was just a wrestler. He was a, he was a good technical Cruiserweight uh, I think he was fucking awesome, to be honest. Uh, and then I think, like, obviously, Eddie Guerrero, when he was in there, but he wasn't in the Cruiserweight division for too long. Chris Jericho, when he first got through the Cruiserweight division, did a really good job. There we go. I think, like, I think Billy Kidman's so underrated. Um, he was, like, one of the big stars in the Cruiserweight division like, for the last couple of years at WCW. But I, thought, I think he did a great job. I think he did a tremendous performance. Comes highly underrated now, in my opinion. And then Ultimo Dragon as well. Really big fan of his work. I think he would be great, like, for the indie scene today. Like, imagine the indies now, like, 
with an Ultimo Dragon on there. Or if a, if a guy like Ultimo Dragon went to the Cruiserweight Classic now, I think he'd blow people away in this era. But yeah, those guys really, then we go. Since you're a huge Bret Hart fan, a uh, huge Bret Hart fan, what were your thoughts on do we still you run with? You discussed how, oh god, yes. I was, oh fucking hell, Bret Hart do we still you run, man? It pisses me off even now. I mean, it's been what? Nearly 20 years later or whatever the fuck it's been. Yeah, it was awful. Really bad. Like, one of the biggest missed opportunities ever, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, we're one of the worst. Like, you had, you had, like, your guys in WWE who went over and had bad runs like Goldberg, Scott Steiner, and all that. But, yeah, this is this has got to be the one for WWE. They had Bret Hart, who was probably Vince's biggest star for the last five years. Um, ended his career in with the controversial Montreal screw job. So you've got him now, and an amazing story, really. One that you couldn't really make up. The whole falling out of Vince in Montreal and all that stuff. You bring him in, then you just completely fucking. You just. You fuck him up, really. It's just, it was really bad how they used him, I mean. Although I will say, towards the end of his WCW run in late 1999, Seemed like he was getting on track. And I've, I've slagged Vince Russo a lot off in the past. Trust me. And I'll continue to slag Vince Russo off. But Russo was the only guy in WCW who attempted to make Bret Hart a main eventer. And I always appreciated that. I feel like he had a great run at the end of 1999. Where winning the uh, Mayhem Tournament to become the world champion. Main event in Starcade of Goldberg. And then he got hurt. Then had to retire. But up to then... Yeah, horror. I mean, you had so many... Ugh. He was arsing about of the US title a lot. Uh, wrestling people on pay-per-view like Booker T and all that. It's like, come on, Hart and Hogan. Can you not see the potential there? I mean, if you push Bret Hart as a big star in WCW, it would, would have helped him a lot, in my opinion. And you were paying Bret like 2.5 million a year. That's the thing. They were paying him so much money to do bugger all with them. I mean, the how arse backwards is that? I mean, if you're paying someone that much, and fair play, Brett got an incredible deal, and they paid him very well, but they use him like fucking shite. Sorry, I, just, I went on a little bit of a rant there, but I'll stop before I go too much. Do you think Doocy we had a better product in, uh, in 1997? Because I actually think, do we really did I, I am or Good lad! Yeah, good lad, I like that. Yeah, that's always been one of my big things over the years. I've always been of the belief that Dude F was better in 1987. So I'm really glad that you said that. Uh, yeah, yeah, for me, Dude Do We had the better products for about a full year before I started showing up in the ratings. I would say from after rest, from just after WrestleMania 13, when Austin turned face and then Brett turned on America and formed the Half Foundation. Raw had the better show, in my opinion, anyway. I feel like WCW was still hot and all that with the NWO and Sting and everything, but I like to do ref show a hell of a lot better with all this stuff like Bret and Austin on top, Shawn Michaels, Undertaker as champion, then feuding with Paul Bear and that old Brock Kane and all that. Yeah, I honestly do, because obviously, 98, I love the ref in 1997, I mean. For me, obviously, all the success that we've had in 1998, 1999, all the groundwork was built in 1997, like Austin getting built, um, the whole US versus Canada thing, Kane coming, the build-up for Kane coming in, start of DX, the rise of Rocky Maivia turning into The Rock, uh, all stuff like that. Uh, uh, underrated part was obviously, then obviously like all the gimmicks were changing, Hunter Hearst Helms, who became Triple H, the road he became the road dog, Rockabilly became Mr. Ass. And then obviously the three faces of the Foley things I thought was really underrated as well. You had a really good roster then as well. You had like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart at the peak, Undertaker, um, Steve Austin when he was exploding. Then you had like good veterans like Vader, Mankind, Goldust, um, reliable upper mid card guys like Owen Hart, the British Bulldog. Uh, the Legion of Doom was still there then you had like obviously the Rock and Triple H were like the young guys coming up and obviously they're pretty much made 
their spots are on during the Attitude Era. So yeah, I really like that comment. Now we go. What are some great WCW Benoit matches? Yep, that's the thing now. Obviously with Chris Benoit doing what he did, his career is getting a bit forgotten about in history. It obviously, when you think of Benoit, you think of his WWE run, but he has some great matches in WCW. So I'll try to go in chronological order and try, hopefully I won't screw it up. So these are Benoit matches in WCW I would recommend. Uh, really early on in Nitro, he had a great match with Eddie Guerrero. Um, can't remember the exact date. I think it was like November 1995 or something like that. And um, that was a tremendous television match. Um, Benoit and Dean Malenko from Hog Wild. Tremendous. But I think it was... No. No, it went 20 minute time limit. Then it went another five. Went a time limit again. And then I think uh, Malenko won after like 28 minutes or something like that. But yeah, I loved, I thought that was a great, great match. Sorry, how are you? Chris Benoit, Kevin Sullivan from Great American Bash 1996. That was a tremendous brawl in my opinion. I uh, loved that one. Um, great, great brawl. There we had there. Then we had a, another, a better match in my opinion between Benoit and Sullivan from Bash at the Beach in 1997. This was uh, Kevin Sullivan's quote-unquote retirement match, which by wrestling standards actually kind of stuck. I don't think he wrestled again until like late 1999. <laughs> Uh, just ignore that. Right. Uh, sorry about that. And then he had a bunch of them in 1998. I mean, excellent match of Raven had sold out. Uh, then him and DDP had a tremendous match of Super Brawl 8. Then, obviously, the one people talk about, the triple threat at Unsets of 1998, Chris Benoit, DDP and Raven. Uh, yep, I really like that. Uh, Spring Sampede 1999, Chris Bedouin, Dean Malenko vs Raven and Perry Satin. Excellent tag team match in my opinion, really should check it out. The best one but though for me is obviously Bret Hart and Chris Benoit. Uh, Owen Hart tribute match October 5th 1999, Nitro. Must see match there and a really underrated match The people do not talk about. Uh, Chris Benoit, Jeff Jarrett ladder match from Starcade 1999. I mean, Starcade 1999 was a truly horrible pay-per-view and all that. But this match was actually pretty damn awesome. I mean, you think a great lot of matches, this one rarely comes up. But yeah, it was an excellent one. And then we got a uh, last one. When you just realised it was going down the drain. This is a tough one to answer. But I'll say WCW first started going downhill around the middle of 1998. Um... Coincidentally, when WWF was getting better, WWF was getting worse. I feel like around the time that the NWO broke off and they became the NWO Wolfpack and NWO Hollywood, um, of the, by that time they'd fucked up the Sting and all that, they were wasting Bret Hart. However, I will say, even though it wasn't as good as it had been before, by any reasonable standard, WWF 1999 had a very good product. Although you look at the quality of pay views setting off in 1998, they do seem to go a lot downhill. I mean, I mean Halloween had it that year. Oh, they, they were doing stuff like bringing the Warrior back and all that. But they were still very successful and they still had a very good product. Then it started getting worse in like early 1999. Then I'll say around the spring of 1999 is when the product just took a massive nosedive. It just, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't even know what happened there. <laughs> So I'll say by 1999, it was pretty obvious the product was nosediving, getting a lot, lot worse. And then, say by mid-1999, it looked like this company's fucked. This company's going down the drain, really. And the sad thing is, I think when they got rid of Bischoff and then brought in Vince Russo, if Russo wasn't such a goddamn idiot, I do feel like at that point, if, he, if he'd gotten the right man to replace Eric Bischoff, in uh, October 1999 or whatever it was, whenever it was, I do feel like WCW could have been turned around at that point because, yeah, Duref, Duref was beating them, but ratings were still okay. Things were, I think, I do, I do feel like it could have been salvaged, but I think Russo took it, made it even worse, and then obviously 2000 happened and that was that really, but yeah. Then we've got Stephen Taylor's questions now. Then we've got um, 
I truly believe R.E.D. could have gotten the Glacier gimmick over. Maybe, I mean, if, for the benefit of those who don't know, R.E.D. apparently was offered the role of Glacier and the jump from ECW. And it was 1997? I'm, sh I'm sure that was 1997. Um, but could have a do I think he could have done better with it. I don't know if he would have got it over over. I mean, I feel like he would have got it over on a mid card level, but not nothing significant. But definitely, RVD would have been a better glacier than the one they got. All at the same time, would RVD really be into it? Would you have really enjoyed being glacier? Because obviously, up to that point, he was Rob Van Dam from ECW. So would would he even if? But if he already did embrace the gimmick, he might have made it work, but I'm not sure. And it's one of those ones we'll never truly know, really, that we got. By looks and on how awesome it stings red and black paint looks. So, yeah, you're on about the Wolfpack one way, when the red and black look. Yeah, by looks, purely by looks, I mean, obviously, I was not a fan of Sting being the end of your Wolfpack at all. Really disliked that. Yeah, but it was, it was a cool look. I mean, I, I prefer the white and black crow sting, but I don't think the Wolfpack sting had a pretty good look. I mean, the red face paint worked quite well. Um, so, yeah, but I always prefer the, the white and black one for sure. Then what have we got now? Should Sting have saved the red and black paint for his heel turn? Yeah, not really. Um, not really. I don't really see the need for that. I think with, with that horrible heel turn 1999, I think it was fine just using his normal look to be honest with you. Um, could maybe change up a bit slightly, but yeah, I didn't really see the need for that one. And what we got, how awesome would it be if Goldberg came in 2001 during the invasion angle and his debut match with Gilbert? Well, I don't, I don't think this is a serious question, but I'll answer it anyway. If it, if it is that match on Raw, that'd be fine. If they did it on Raw, Goldberg, Speed, Gilbert, Jack Hammond, and that was it, fine. But if they, like, did that on pay-per-view, that would be bloody... So if they did that at, like, the Invasion pay-per-view, that would be absolutely bloody stupid. I mean, in all, I, know, I know you were joking, but in all seriousness, no. Doing Goldberg and Austin in 2001 would have been absolutely fucking huge. I, feel, I do, honestly do feel it would have broken records and all that. There we go. How big a missed opportunity was it not to do Goldberg versus Ric Flair at a WCW pay per view? The man in the 80s versus the biggest WCW big pay per in the 1990s? Yeah. Yeah, they never did that, did they? I mean, I'm pretty sure they did it at least once or twice on Nitro, if I remember right. Well, yeah, they never did it on pay per view. And yeah, you're thinking, like, out of all the big names Goldberg faced, you never faced Flair on pay per view, so. See if you did it with. Like, I don't know, uncensored 1999. When Flair had that last title run in 1999, would have been a decent little match to do, I think. I feel even at 50, Flair would have got something decent out of Goldberg. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that would have been cool. Then what have we got now? Tien Coupenaire. That sounds really, really French, that name. Um, so, I if I pronounce it wrong, I have to apologise for that. Um. If you could go back in time and attend any WCW event, which one it would it be and why? Obvious answer would be Bash at the Beach 1986. That's obviously the one where Hawking turned heel, joined the NWO. Um, uh, joined the NWO. That would just... Because that moment was fucking epic, really, wasn't it? Just Hulk Hogan turned heel after all these years. Really special moment, wasn't it, really? Um Never forget that more. That would have been amazing live. They've got five biggest missed opportunity matches in WCW. Um, tough one because they actually did most like dream matches actually did happen in some form. Um, but obviously the one for me is a proper match between Bret Hart and Hollywood Hogan in 1998. Winds me up this day. They never did that. That was bloody awful. I would say a proper main event between Goldberg and Sting. I mean, they had the one at Slamboree in 1999, but I think it was, wasn't was shot. And then obviously, like a five minute match at Halloween Havoc 1999. But same match between Goldberg and Sting that had been built up over time. Um, built up over time and all that. Uh, that would have been great. Then we got um, 
There's not there's not many really, is there? I can't really think of many at all. That's a, that's a problem. Like most of them happened, to be fair. But um, I, I can't think. Um, maybe Booker T and Goldberg when Booker T was a champion. Uh, Mark Goldberg Steiner matches. Actually, ah, I've got one. During the New Blood Angle of 2000, instead of Hogan and Billy Kidman, there should have been Goldberg and Hogan and... No, what, what? I just completely got that wrong. So instead of Hogan and Kidman, there should have been Hulk Hogan and Scott Steiner. I think that would have been a great feud back then. I mean, because obviously Scott Steiner was getting pushed towards the world title, and I feel like big program with Hogan instead of Kidman at that time, with Hogan putting Steiner over like a motherfucker... Would have been would have been a great move in my opinion. Also, one more I suppose, Starcade nineteen ninety eight, Kevin Nash versus Hulk Hogan, the leader of the NWO Wolfpack versus the leader of NWO Hollywood. That maybe they could have done that and officially blown off the NWO angle once and for all, and um, with Hogan letting Nash beat him, I think. So yeah, those ones the ones that are signed out. And what have we got? Let's say if Deuce of the went under. With Scott Stein's injuries catching up, run. When would you guess he was going to have to drop the title? Because, because looking back, I highly doubt we could risk dealing with that injury all the way to Starkid when he's dragging his foot with Buck T, which was in March. And when do you think he'd be able to make it back after taking time for dropping the title? I'd have probably, I don't know, I'd probably, I suppose like that was March. So if you went to the next pay of view, which would have been April, could have dropped the title there, taken six months off maybe. Came back around the time of Halloween Havoc to do a big match with Goldberg at Starcade, possibly. See if Goldberg had won the title from Booker T in the interim, then Steiner could have came back to challenge Goldberg for the world title, maybe. But of yeah, like you say, obviously, because he looked absolutely fucked in that match with Booker T. So there's no way he could have really carried on wrestling for the rest of the year, I think. Would have been wise for him to drop the title at the earliest opportunity and then take time off and then try to recover and come back at a later date. But even when he came back, like do do he looked fuck then, so I think mean, yeah, he was dealing with a lot more than foot injuries. I think he had back problems as well. Obviously the style he wrestled years late earlier in the mid nineties had taken a toll and then for other reason <coughs> steroids had hurt his um had a damaging effect on his health as well. There we go. If Goldberg wasn't injured do you think he would have been on the last Nitro and who would he have in face DDP? Well, Goldberg actually wasn't injured, though. This is after... They, they retired Goldberg at Sin, basically. Um, when him and Sarge lost to Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell. Yep, that was Goldberg's last match in WCW. What a way to go out, losing to Luger and Bagwell. So Goldberg actually wasn't injured. He was just taking time off. And obviously, he was going to come back in the storylines later on, but... I do feel like we should have just brought him back for the last Nitro. And yeah, I think DDP would have been an ideal opponent, I think, to be honest. But that was that was Goldberg's greatest ever match, DDP. So that would have been... how Yeah, that would, that would have been awesome, actually, thinking about it. That last, last Nitro, you would have had Booker T, Steiner, Sting and Flair. And if you had Goldberg and DDP sandwiched in there as well, that would be, that'd be awesome, actually, you now I think about it. So well done. I've always said that WCW should have done Goldberg versus Sting of Stark in 1998. I feel like they could have played off the match he had on Nitro with Sting, talking about how he had Goldberg beat. Hogan came out to help him and then could have brought him the streak because he couldn't break the Scorpion Deathlock. Then Goldberg basically accepts his challenge in a Starcade where Sting comes out instead of the Wolfpack music. His Chrome music hits and he comes out on uh, black and white. You're forcing that idea. Only thing I would change... Um, I would have done Goldberg and Sting, yes, but for me, to make it even better, it would have had to have been a first-time dream match. Um, I understand, like, the story of the whole Nitro match and all that, but I do feel like it would have been a lot better if it was just Goldberg and Sting at Starcade for the first time ever. I do love the idea, though, of, um, of him dropping that Wolfpack thing and going back to Cross Sting for that match as a surprise. That's a really cool idea. But, yeah, I just feel like Sting somehow becomes the unwanted tender. I think they're still doing World War Three back then. Right? Because isn't that how Nash became the unwanted tender, I think? By winning that World War Three match. And then, so basically, Sting wins that. And then, obviously, like you have Goldberg. 
being everybody up at this point now he's got to beat the icon the franchise sting ne uh, baby face baby baby face that would have been awesome and i mean i think that would have been a better draw than sting and goldberg and nash to be honest with you not this and kevin nash but i just feel like sting was a bigger star than nash so and the match would have been pretty good oh i'm not too concerned about match quality to be honest with you because it's not that important really but that would have been cool yeah, what have we got? Last one. How do you think Vader would have been used had he stayed in WCW? Well, if you, well, you might not remember, but so Vader was originally, do you know that, remember that Hulkamania Dungeon of Doom fucking War Games match with Fall Brawl 1995? You probably don't because it was fucking awful, but if some of you do remember that, it was um, supposed to be Vader on that team with Hogan, Savage and Sting. Then Vader ended up getting fired for starting to fight with Paul Orndorff backstage and then went to the UF in early 1997 six of the Royal Rumble 1996 so yeah so how Sting would have been used I do feel like uh, no how Vader would have been used sorry I do feel like he was coming to the end anyway I mean he had his run with Hogan and Ho he kind of uh, Hogan kind of fucked him over in that few to be honest with you kind of stripped Vader his monster aura now he's a baby face, so I don't feel, I feel like his time in the main event scene was done. Couldn't see him getting back to that, so US title, possibly. He'd probably been around the US title level, probably would have turned back heel. Uh, maybe feud with Savage, I think that's a feud they never they never did in 1995, they could have looked at. Is a face could have been a great opponent for the giant. Um, obviously G monster versus monster and I feel like Vader could have taught Giant a lot during that run then might have had runners with the NWO during when they turned heel and all that in 1996 um, but yeah I don't think he was ever going to be world champion or probably would never have main event to pay for you again or anything like that and then we got um, we got uh, we need it well, we need it yeah, no. this, this, this is not a long video for once um, why did WCW? Why did WCW stop Aaron Clash the champions in 1997, especially when WCW was at its peak at the time? I feel just like because wait, well, they had Nitro now. Nitro was a big show every single week. They had 12 pay-per-views a year, and I think at this time it was already established that they were going to launch Thunder in 1998. So, and they were still doing Saturday night as well. So, just feel like it was a. Uh, they didn't. They didn't need to do Clash of Champions anymore. It wasn't really. It wasn't something they needed to do anymore. So I feel. I feel like that's why they scrapped it because they had Nitro drawn record ratings at that point. Uh, they had twelve pay per views. They didn't really need Clash of Champions anymore. Because if you, as you can, if you'll see, like when they expanded the pay per views in nineteen eighty five, they got less and less Clash of the Champions. I feel like. I feel like we only got like four ninety five. Three or four in 1996 and a couple in 1997. So yeah, I think that's the reason really, because because the night rolls of bread and butter at that point, the pay per views of bread and butter and clash of the champion it was kind of losing its relevance at that point anyway. So I feel like they should have just dropped it. And then suppose the NWO only in capital letters he's wrote there only consisted of wrestlers who were made at the start by a the time. I.e. no Bischoff, no Giant. Oh, I totally understand that. Um, I do kind of feel that's kind of how they should have done it. Because obviously the whole point of the end of it, or at the start, was New York guys taking over Dewey. That was the whole reason behind Nash and Hall coming in, was the angle of the outsiders coming in from New York, the ref to take over WCW, and then they got the ultimate ref guy in Hogan. Um, but yeah, over time that changed, I mean... Started out on that vein, and the, the, I think the next members were DBRC, Virgil, and Six, who was X Pac, one, two, three, kid. Um, then after that, Giant came in. I think obviously you bring in Savage, and then guys like Norton, Bagwell, and all that. But yeah, I do think at that point the NWO lost its exclusive, like, should have been a more exclusive club. And um, I like, I really do like the idea of them. Um, it's been exclusive to guys who had made it in the Duref in the past. That would have made a lot more sense to me. Here we go here. Suppose DC established a half foundation like faction with Brett Bulldog, Nighthard, Benoit, Jericho, 1998. Yeah. 
I do think they should have done that to be fair. Um, obviously Bulldog and Neidhart followed Brett to WCW, Owen didn't. And obviously Pillman had died in October 1987. So when the, you had three of the original Hart Foundation members in there, uh, Brett, obviously Brett, I'll talk about Brett to WCW run, but I feel like Bulldog and Neidhart had a horrible run as well. Um, but if you put them in there, they could have been a decent play. Obviously, you probably would have got crushed by the NWO, but would have been nice to see another faction. Obviously, yep, you're right, Benoit and Jericho would have been ideal candidates to fill the roles of Owen and Pillman. Obviously, Benoit trained in there in the mid-80s with Stu and Bruce Hart and all that. Started his career in Stampede Wrestling. Jericho had tr sort of trained in the Hart family dungeon. I mean, in reality, he joined a Hart Brothers wrestling camp, which... It was only Hart in the name only, no Hart after he ran the train, but according to Jericho, it was run by Emmanuel, written by Stu many years later. And obviously Jericho got his start in Calgary. Um, perhaps they could have brought in Lance Storm from ECW to come in as well. Obviously Lance Storm had the Hart, the Hart family dungeon thing to his name, so that would have been cool. But yeah, obviously Brett, Davey, Neidhart, the original three, and then... Benoit could have left, because obviously Benoit, I don't think Benoit needed to be a horseman. Um, I mean, I think mean Benoit left the four horsemen, then nobody would have massively cared about that. And then obviously Jericho would have been an ideal candidate as well. And we got Force of the British Bulldogs 1993 WCW run. Yeah, pretty good. I mean, shame it didn't last too long. I think it was only there from like Super Brawl. And he was gone by Starkid. I mean, his last bit of it was Halloween Havoc. And then he left some time between Halloween Havoc and Starkid. But he got pushed quite well. I mean, um, uh, him and Stingfield with Vader and Sid Vicious. He even main evented a pit. Was, was it Slambray in 1983? He main evented against Vader for the world title. So, main evented two pay-per-views. Um, had a... Pretty solid match with Stephen Regal at Halloween Havoc. Um, if he hadn't left, it looked like he was probably going to face Rick Rude at Starcade that year. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think he had a nice run after his WF run, but for me, Davey always looked more at home in the WWF. Like, obviously, back then, some guys you associate, obviously, even though they went back to other promotions, you associate them more with one promotion, and I feel like. Davey suited being in the WF more than he suited being in WCW. Then we got what if the notorious backstage politicians such as Hogan, Nash, Hall, etc. were never given the book of creative call controlling the contracts? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, would WCW still be around? I don't know. Because I feel like all the internal problems with the Time Warner merger still would have happened. But yeah. And to this day, it's disputed how many guys actually had creative control. To this day, Eric Bischoff insists Hulk Hogan's the only one who had it in his contract. But other guys have said they had it. Um, so, but yeah, obviously, like, when guys have creative control in the contracts and stuff, it becomes a bit of a problem because, and obviously the, gar the guaranteed money as well, guys getting guaranteed millions no matter what. Gives them less incentive to work hard. Um, but the creative control ones, like, when, when when someone says, like, you can't I you can't, you can't do do this unless I say so, puts all the power into the wrestler and it just doesn't create a good environment. Um, obviously, perhaps, like, a few guys' careers wouldn't have been screwed with. Um, do we see we could have been a better place without it and all that? Oh, Bischoff's defence, Bischoff never created guaranteed contracts. Uh, guaranteed contracts existed before Bischoff came in. Um, so if Hogan didn't have creative control, obviously Starcade 1997 could have went off a bit better. And obviously Nash and Hall could have done more and all that stuff. But so yeah, it, I do feel like Doocy would have been better off without him, but I think all the problems might have still happened anyway. Then we got... Albert Butler, what's your favourite cruiserweight to watch? Uh, said this before, but easy answer really. It's got to be Rey Mysterio. Just it's quite mind blowing how innovative he was at that time. 
Um, obviously, like, a lot of your stuff you did then aren't that impressive now because guys have taken it to a whole new level in the last 20 years, but... Sorry about that. Um, some of the stuff Rey Mysterio was doing back then was incredible, to be fair. Then we got... Um, I think WCW would have been if Tony didn't spoil Foley's victory. Not really any different, to be honest with you. I mean, only thing that would have been different is um, you know, the rating that night would have been a lot closer. Approximately half a million people wouldn't have then immediately switched to Raw. Because obviously, oh, this was the night. That, but obviously, if Shivani didn't spoil that thing, that stupid thing to put with doing would have still happened. All the WCW's problems would have still happened. The company still, well, pretty much everything that happened after that would have still happened. And at the same time, uh, the rest of the momentum was just going to continue to rise and ratings were going to get better and better and better. But yeah, the only difference is, if Savani didn't say that, approximately half a million people wouldn't have then immediately switched over to Raw. So, so WCW would have been a lot closer to Raw on the ratings that night than they actually were. And then what have we got? Who do you think should have ended Goldberg's streak? Now, this is a question I've often debated over the years. I mean, it really is a hot topic conversation between the rest of the fans. Um, some people say DDP should have done it in Halloween Havoc 1998. And if that had happened, I would not have minded at all. I feel that would have been great. And the thing is, I don't... About oh, Nash... I don't necessarily think Nash was the wrong guy to end the streak. I just don't feel it should have ended then. In that, the, my my problem's not Nash ending the streak. In theory, that's fine. I mean, Nash was seven foot, three hundred pounds, so believability wise, he could have beaten Goldberg in a fight, possibly. Um, but if this is it's, it's what happened afterwards that was the problem. I mean. If this, if this had led to Nash getting a big run on top and Goldberg chasing him and then after after months later, Goldberg finally getting his revenge and getting the title back. Hell, but no. This led to that fucking horrible finger poke could do him like eight days later. So you sacrifice Goldberg's streak for this. And even then, if he made the right moves after that, he could have justified it. I mean, if... Goldberg then had run through the NWO elite and then finally got his title back. That would have been cool, but that didn't happen either because Hogan ended up dropping the belt to Flair, who ended up dropping the belt to DDP at Spring Stampede. But if it was up to me, this is what I would do. I would have had Goldberg keep the streak in the 1989. Then you build Scott Steiner up through that year. Then, see it. Spring to summer in 1999, you have Goldberg versus Steiner, Monster Faith versus Monster Hill, and then Steiner's the one to end the streak. I feel like that would have been so. If, if, to answer you, I know that was a bit of a long answer, but to answer your question, Scott Steiner would be my guy to end the streak. There we go. What do we see? WCW's best pay per view of the NWO era? Um, I'll probably, I favour Fall Brawl 1996. I feel like that's a really good pay per view. A uh, great pay per view, in fact. Um, there's some others, close ones like Soup Brawl 8, Uncensored 1998. And I, I would have went for Great American Bash in 1996, but that's right before the, like, the NWO era kicked off at Bash at the Beach. Although National Hall had been in before that, but for Brawl 1996, um, this had a little bit of everything. Big stars, uh, great cruiserweights, some good technical wrestling. I mean, you had a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the matches. Uh, Benoit Jericho, that was on that one. Rey Mysterio Super Calo. DDP Chavo, which is really good. Hooventude, I think Hooventude and Conan had a nice gem that show. And I feel like Eddie Guerrero wrestled someone, but I can't remember who it was. I think Eddie Guerrero had a match or something. Then I was Giant Beat Savage. And then the great main, War Games main event of the... Uh, WCW, Sting, Luger, Flair and Arn against Hogan, Hall, Nash and then NWO Sting, which that was a big time main event, which uh, led to some awesome storylines down the line. So I'll go for Fall Brawl 1996. It's on the WWE Network, so I'll watch it. Then we've got, what do you think of the Bret Hart and Sting feud and WCW? Um, I feel like it was just alright. 
I mean, it was really disappointing, in my opinion. I mean, this is something of a dream feud if you were a wrestling, match, wrestling fan in the early 1990s. Bret Hart versus Sting, especially like when Bret was on top of the WWF and Sting was on top of WCW, and they were both baby faces, and they were both using the sharpshooter slash scorpion Deathlock. So, but then when it happened, it was just yeah, it wasn't bad feud or anything like that, but it was not particularly exciting. Like the Halloween Havoc match was just meh, bang on average, nothing good, nothing bad. The field itself was just all right, so yeah, definitely a really big disappointment in my opinion. Should have been a hell of a lot better than it was. Then we got Charlie King, and he has one. No, he's got two questions. No, three questions. Sorry. Most enjoyable show. Um, answered this one earlier. Great American Bash, 1989. That was a fucking classic, amazing show. Then we got this is a good one. Most enjoyable in ring year for me, anyway. I'll probably say 1992. This is a Bill Watts era, which gets criticised a hell of a lot. But go back, watch these shows, and then if you, if, if you watch it from a purely in ring point of view, this was awesome. This was an awesome year. I mean, look at the talent you had. You had Sting, Rick Rude, v Big Van Vader, Ricky Steamboat, the Steiners. Uh, Cactus Jack, Brian Pillman, um, yeah, you had, you had some of your best matches that year, like Pillman Liger Super Brawl, Sting Squadron Dangerous Alliance, uh, War Games, uh, Sting the Road Iron Man match, those were three classics, those were absolute fucking classic, Sting and Cactus Jack at Beach Blast, um, Steiners versus Gordian Williams matches, and um, yeah, honestly, and the pay is like Super Brawl 2 was awesome. Beach Blast was tremendous, one of the best shows you'll ever, you ever like you to see. Wrestle War was really good. Uh, some of the clashes were good at that time, so. From in ring point of view, I really loved WCW in 1982. Then we've got a uh, best match in 1995. Uh, Johnny, Johnny B. Bad Brian Pillman from Fall Brawl 1985. Uh, that was that was a tremendous opener. I think it went like close to 30. Not when I think it's the new one that went to a 20 minute time limit. Had overtime. Went to a time limit again. Then went five. Was going to go five moments, but I think uh, Johnny picked up the victory in like 28 minutes. That was that was a tremendous match. Really loved that match. And um, definitely check that one out if you haven't seen it. Great match. And there we go. Last set of questions from Princess Strong Style. 9v2 um, as always uh, underrated gems and classics so try and do it chronologically and hopefully I don't have a brain fart and forget um, Steamboat and Luger from the Great American Bash uh, 89 that's a, that's a four and a half star match in my book um, Class of the Champions 7 main event Ricky Steamboat versus Terry Funk um, yeah, that was a really good match, like a really good one. Um, what was that? I'm trying to I'm, I'm have a little think. Uh, Rock and Roll Midnight Express from Wrestle War. That was an excellent match. Um, uh, Flair and Lucas Capital Combat Cage match. People talk about the Starcade 1998, 1988 match. Um, the Wrestle War 90 match, but... We had another really good match here at um, Capital Combat. That was really good. Steiners and the Nasty Boys from Halloween Havoc 1980. This was Nasty Boys' first WCW run before getting snapped by the Dura. Steiners were on fire at that point in their careers. Just a great match overall, really. Then we got um, Ric Flair and Tatsumi Fujinami from Super Brawl 1. That was a pretty good match. Um, a lot of people don't remember that one because this was right before Flair left for the WWF. This is one of Flair's last pay-per-views, actually, if I remember right. Um, do we have um, Rude and Rick Rude and Ricky Steamboat from Super Brawl Two? Yeah, obviously, people talk about the Beach Blast one, but they had a, they also had a great match there too as well. Um, Going back because I forgot one, Ric Flair, Brian Pillman, I think it was WCW main event in like, 
I think it was 90, I think. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, um, but I'm sure I'm pretty sure Flair was the NWA champion when it happened, so it had to have been at some point in the first half of 1990. I'm almost certain it was WCW main event. Um, obviously, go back in 1991, Sting and Cactus Jack had a submission match, which I believe, I believe that was Power Hour, I think. Because Dewey Super had a lot of different television shows, some short-lived, they kind of get forgotten about. So let's go back to where we were before. Um, what we got? What do you call it? Uh, I'll probably say the Steiners versus Gordon Williams 30-minute draw beach blast. That was pretty badass. Ricky Steamboat, Brian Pillman from Halloween Havoc 1992. Really good match. Cactus Jack Paul Orndorff from Super Brawl 3. That was a great brawl. And awesome at the time to see Paul Orndorff back. And Rock and Roll Express vs. Heavenly Bodies also from Super Brawl 3. I mean, obviously, people remember uh, Rock and Roll Express against the Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Dale Ray version of Heavenly Bodies Survivor Series that year in the WWF. But the Smoky Mountain stuff happened in uh, WCW first. Which I bet a lot of people don't remember that. Um, trying to think. Uh, yeah. Let's have a thing, big man. Um, Arn Anderson, Stephen Regal for Super Brawl 4. That was a tremendous match. Great technical wrestler match. Um, Vader versus the boss from Spring Stampede. That was a really good one. Steamboat and Austin from Bash at the Beach. Everyone remembers. The Clash of Champions match, but they had a great match at the Bash at the Beach as well. Um, can't really think much from 1985. Um, Malenko Guerrero's first WCW match together in October 1985 on Nitro. That was a great little television match. Um, Stephen Regal versus Fit Finley from Uncentered 1996. That was a manly man match. Uh, Stephen Regal and Sting from Great American Bash 1996. That was tremendous. Really was good. Chris Benoit, Jeff Jarrett from Starcade 1996. That gets forgotten. Possibly my favourite WCW underrated gem that would be Ric Flair, Kevin Green and Roddy Piper versus Kevin Ashcott on Sticks from Slamboree 1997. I thought, that was I thought that was fucking tremendous. That was the one in Charlotte as well. That was just a great match. Really was. Then we've got Chris Benoit, Kevin Sullivan from Bash at the Beach, 1987. Flair and Piper from that show. Yeah, Rick Flair and Roddy Piper actually had a hell of a match in uh, 1997 of all times. That was really something. Um, most of the Booker T, Rick Martell matches of 1998. Really like that. Um, Booker T, Eddie Guerrero from Uncensored, 1998. I think, I think it was Uncensored. I'm sure. No, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, Underrated main events, Sting and Randy Savage from Spring Stampede 1998. Um, might review that show one day. But, so watch this space on that one. Um, Hoover and Toon and Kidden from World War 3 1998. That was really good. Um, Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Raven Perry Sutton, Spring Stampede 1999. Awesome match there. Ben Juan Jarrett from Starcade that year. Uh, Booker T and Lance Storm from Nitro on like August of 2000. One of the better Nitro matches towards the end. And then last pay to view they had. Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman versus Edith Skipper and Kid Romeo. A tremendous tag team match. Then we got Would he and WCW have benefited if Ricky Steamboat didn't leave to go back to do between 89 and 1981? Considering both are failing for a certain amount of time. Oh yeah, of course I would, I mean. If Dewey Silver had Ricky Steamboat, that would have been great. Um, Steamboat, would have, Steam, Steamboat would have been better off staying in Dewey Silver instead of going back to the ref to have that awful dragon run. But yeah, he could have done a ton of stuff in throughout 90, 89, 90. I mean, he could have wrestled Arn Anderson. I think that would have been cool as shit. I think it really would, I think. Him and Moot, I think, would have had fucking tremendous matches. Fuck, oh, fuck me. That would have been fucking awesome, wouldn't it? Steamboat and the Great Moot, eh? Um, 
could have tagged up with some him and Pillman could have maybe tagged up like a mentor and student type tag team to face the likes of the Midnight Express, the Freebirds and all that. So there's, pl I think there's plenty of stuff Steamboat could have done if he stuck around. Um, always a valuable guy to have around for sure. Then we go. What are some characters or storylines look interesting on paper? Either failed or weren't followed up upon. Example, the Mortal Kombat storyline of Glater and Mortis. Yeah, that was the one. At the time, it was a sound theory. Mortal Kombat was hot at the time. A lot of video game enthusiasts are also wrestling fans. So, you do something Mortal Kombat related and that would have got over. But, for some reason, it didn't really get over that well. and Didn't really work. Um, I, also, I always thought... Um, I always thought Raven... Could have been used a hell of a lot better in WCW at the time. And um, he had an interesting look. Could great talker, good brawler. Definitely the flock could have been a lot more than they actually were, I feel. I feel him and because him and DDP had the feud and then he dropped the title to Goldberg the next night and then did nothing after that really. I feel like they could have gone back to Goldberg and DDP at some point. I also thought like the Goldberg and Sid feud in 1999 could have been great if WCW was in better shape at the time. I think they had a tremendously underrated feud back then, especially the Halloween Havoc match where Goldberg just made Sting, no, Goldberg made Sid bleed like a motherfucker. So yeah, I feel like if Sid, like, talk about character, I think Sid, if WCW was hotter when he came in, could have meant a lot more. It's just the fact Sid came in the second half of 1999 and then, WCW was going down the toilet, really. Um, but yeah, if Sid came in, in a, during a hot period, he could have done a lot more, in my opinion. So that would have been a great one. Um, I can't, that's all I can think of, really. Then we got what sometimes you thought had potential to go to succeed, but others don't like eh? What are some talents you thought had potential to go succeed what others don't like? Alright, okay. Right, sorry about that. Right, I think I get it. So people, some people are think are good, but other people weren't really fans of. Uh, yeah, Sid, for one. feel like... Because obviously, I, I do feel like there's a big, a big guy bias in the IWC. A lot of IWC people don't like guys because they're big and they only have two moves and all that crap. So I feel like Sid's definitely one. I feel like Sid could have been a big deal in WCW. If he'd stuck at it, it was hotter. I feel like if he brought when they brought John Tenter in, if they'd give him a big push in 1995, I think he could have done a lot better than being Avalanche and then the Shark. That was bad, wasn't it, really? Um, I, I would say Raven. I think a lot of people liked Raven. Um... But it's hard to say really, I feel like uh, Canyon maybe? A lot of people aren't a lot of people forget about Canyon. I think he could have done a lot better. And like especially the later part of WCW. I feel like the wall was not a like the wall was a pretty decent monster in two thousand, but I feel like obviously WCW was in the shitter and all that, so I feel like WCW, I always do you know what? Here's one. I've, I've never confessed this before until now. So, this is the first time confession. I actually kind of got the Tank Abbott push. I mean, I know Tank was an absolutely terrible wrestler. I, mean, I know he was horrible in the ring. I get that. I really do. But, kind of feel like if you put him in the ring with the right guys, he could have been carried to decent matches. And obviously, like, because he's one where Russo got kicked off the creative team for suggesting Tank Abbott win the world title. This is when Bret had to retire and lose drop the strap. So I can't, I kind of get that to be honest with you. I'm not. I know I hate agreeing with his, but thing is like Tank Abbott had just come out of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, right? I know he wasn't a top fighter and all that, but he had the believability. Yeah, he, he had the. He, he looked menacing. He had the believability factor in the sense that in a shoot, he probably would have whipped anyone in WCW in a real fight. Um, so, obviously, obviously he was limited in his skills, but 
you, you, you can work through that. I mean, I know a lot of people didn't like Tank Abbott, but I, I feel like with the right push, um, like hiding his flaws and all that, putting with the right guys, I actually think he could have been a success. I really do. I mean, you're probably all going to click off this video now and discuss, and then or write in the comment section, "Oh, I'm, oh, I'm Jalen. You were such an idiot. How can you say that about Tank Abbott?" But that's a I don't, if, I don't even think I've ever confessed on Astor FM, actually, to be fair, but you're getting an exclusive there. So, yeah, there you go, guys. I actually kind of like Tank Abbott. Then we've got last question. This is a tough one, though, because you've actually um, made this one tougher, me, you bastard. Top 10 Doozy Dewey television matches, which would be easy, right? Except Mr. Strongstyle here has wrote in brackets. Excluding Clash of the Championship matches in the interest of fairness. You son of a bitch. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for, ta for taking the Clash of Champions away from me. So, I I I'm going to do it though. I'm going to get it right. Number one, Bret Hart, Chris Benoit. Um, Owen Hart tribute match at uh, Nitro, October the 5th, 1999. Uh, number two, Rick Flair and Rick... I can't remember the... For a lot of these matches, I don't remember the exact dates, but I'll try and explain it to you so you know which one I'm talking about. Uh, number two, Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat. Uh, Spring Stampede rematch from WCW Saturday night. I think it was May of 1994. Could have the date wrong, but obviously the Flair Steamboat match at Spring Stampede resulted in a double pin. So that necessitated a rematch, which happened here on air. Uh, Saturday night. This was another awesome match in the Ric Flair Ricky Steamboat rivalry. Number three, Sting versus Diamond Dallas Page from Nitro, April 26, 1999. I remember that date. And um, yeah, what what a match that was. I mean, I bet at the time no one was thinking this match was going to be that awesome. I mean, Sting hadn't really had many great matches since uh, in 1998. But yeah. Somehow this match was just somehow awesome. I'm still not quite sure why it was that good, but it was that good. So number four, and this is something that would be, would be a dream tag team match, really. It was Saturday night, um I think it was July in nineteen eighty four. It was Rick Flair and Stun and Steve Austin versus Sting and Ricky Steamboat. I first saw it on the Stone Cold Bottom Line DVD that they really put out a few years ago. And I'm sure if you look it up, you'll be able to find it on YouTube or Daily Motion. I'm sure it'll be out there somewhere. Um, so that match was absolutely tremendous. Number five, the Ric Flair Bar Brian Pillman match that I've spoke about. Um, definitely one worth checking out. Number six, Singing Cactus Jack from Power Hour. I've also talked about that one in the past, like in this past video. Then we've got number seven. Let's try and think. Four more spots. Who are they going to go to? Um, think, Mr. Lundrick. Think. Um, Rick Flair, Eddie Guerrero, Nitro, May 1986. That's, that's obviously now number seven. Rick Flair, Ricky. Yeah, Rick Flair, Ricky Steamboat from 1986. Uh, May 1986, I think it was for the. I'm pretty sure that was a US title match. I could be wrong about that though. Um, let's have a thing. Number eight, we've got Flair and Savage for the world title in like, I think it was February 1996. This was the one after Super Brawl where Flair won the title back from Savage. Uh, number nine, Cactus Jack, Big Van Vader, the second match in 1993. Like, the first one's the one where Vader broke Cactus' nose. And then the second... This is a... This is a powerbomb on the concrete floor match. Um, I'm pretty sure it was April of 1983, I think. That was awesome. Then, number 10, rounded up. Ric Flair and... Ricky, no, not Ric Flair. Ricky Steamboat and Vader Lumberjack match. Also from 1983. Like I say, I cannot remember... What the date was, but it was a world title match. It was on the WWE World Title DVD a few years ago. So yeah, um, yeah, that's it. Mm, that's not bad. One hour twenty minutes. That's that's not a bad video for me, is it, guys? So thanks for the questions. 
Don't know when the next one's going to be. Um, mouth for now, guys, and peace.